Well, it's interesting how every book, in an odd way, has its own life. So I moved to New York City in 1978 to go to New York University, and immediately I was part of the art scene in New York. I was very good friends with Keith Haring, and in fact, the first poetry readings um, I did were part of his uh, Wednesday night poetry events that he used to have at Club 57. And then Suzanne moved to New York in 1980, and we actually met, we were both working as waitresses at a Mexican restaurant. Welcome to CC, the podcast where you see what others see. Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sissy, the podcast where you see what others see. In this season, we're talking about movement. And today, we'll talk about prose, fiction, poetry, and its power to break frontiers, change a society, and move the world. Our guest today is worldwide celebrated author Jennifer Clement, known for her enchanting writings of poetic prose and her ability to create poetry of lingering metaphors, a connecting point among the brutal, the beautiful, and the infinite. Her books have been translated into 35 languages. She is President Emerita of the celebrated international writers' organization PEN International and the only woman to be elected since the organization was founded in London back in 1921. It was under her leadership that the groundbreaking PEN International Women's Manifesto and the Democracy of the Imagination Manifesto were created, and since then both have transcended PEN through their adoption by organisations around the world. President of PEN Mexico from 2009 to 2012 as well, Clement is co-founder and director of San Miguel Poetry Week, along with her sister, Barbara Sibley, and is a member of Mexico's prestigious Sistema Nacional de Criadores. She's the author of the novels The Poison That Fascinates, a true story based on lies, and the acclaimed Gun Love, named a New York Times editor's choice book, and one of Time's 10 Best Fiction Books of 2018, as well as Prayers of the Stolen, a worldwide success honoured as New Statement Book of the Year, peaked by Nobel Prize laureate Kazuo Ishiguro and made into a movie, which has won many prizes, including two at the Cannes Film Festival. Her writings include the cult classic memoir Widow Basquiat, four exquisite collections of poetry books named The Next Stranger, Newton Sailor, Lady of the Broom, and Jennifer Clement, New and Selected Poems, as well as the prize-winning story A Salamander Child, published as an art book with work by the Mexican painter Gustavo Monroy, and her last novel published Auf der Zunge at Zürkamp Verlag, where many of her books can be found in German. She studied English literature and anthropology at New York University and French literature in Paris, France. She has an MFA in fiction from the University of Southern Maine and has been named the Sydney Harmon Writer-in-Residence at Barrack College in New York City. Her work has been recognised with numerous honours, such as the UK's Canongate Prize, the Sarah Curry Humanitarian Award, the Grand Prix de l'Ectrice Le Seine de Elle and the Freedom of Expression Award given in Brussels by Brussels University Alliance, VUB and ULB. Other recipients include Svetlana Alexievich, Jiang Zhan, Ahmed Altan, Daphne Caruana Galizia and her family, and Rafe Badawi, among others. A recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, a McDowell Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, Jennifer Clement has also been granted a Hip Giver Honour, which is given to Latinos who have made exceptional contributions to their communities. 
Good morning, Jennifer Clement. What a pleasure and how wonderful to have you here today. Hello, Cecilia. I'm so happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. Jennifer, you were born in Connecticut, raised in Mexico, educated under the British educational system, and later went to university in the U.S. and France. How was living in Mexico and going to a British school, and how tight was your relationship to your father, who I've heard was primarily who introduced you to the world of literature and music and an art? So it's always a bit odd for me to have been born in the United States because I moved to Mexico when I was six months old or a little bit older. And so I never remember living in the United States. And what occurred in Mexico at that time is that uh, there was no sort of real uh, proper uh, ministry of education in Mexico. And so very often, like the German community started the German school, for example, the Swiss community did the same, the French community did the same, the American school. And it turned out that the British school was very close to where we lived. And so I went to the British school, which actually was the school where many artists and intellectuals and diplomats sent their children. And so We were sort of 200 children and 30 different nationalities, and it was a very strict British uh, uh, education. I would say, yes, my father influenced me. He was a great lover of literature. He knew a lot of Shakespeare by heart, for example. He was very concerned that we would have a good education. I remember he ordered a set of encyclopedias from the UK that took about two years to get here by boat. And uh, and then, of course, at the British education, uh, you know, we we started Shakespeare at a very young age, studied Chaucer, studied uh, Beowulf and Dickens, and on and on into into the present. So even in school, the literary education was very strong. Until recently, I think the end of last August, Fondation Louis Vuitton showed a great exhibition about the work of Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And the poster of this exhibition is a very cool. It had both standing side by side wearing uh, boxing acquire, uh, attire. <laughs> and But le not less cool is your Basquiat memoir turned into a cult read. And I have a couple of questions about this book. But first, let's hear an excerpt of your novel, Widow Basquiat. She always keeps her heroine inside her beehive hairdo the white powder hidden in the teas and spit. The cops can't find it. The drug addicts can't find it. Suzanne holds her head high. She's carrying a world without corners. She's holding up the sky. Slight enough to go down chimneys, Suzanne looks like a little girl dressed up in her mother's clothes. She wears Love That Red Lipstick by Revlon and has blue-black hair and white skin, She closes up all the buttons on her shirt. Suzanne can knit, ice skate, sing, read palms, and smoke dozens of cigarettes to keep warm inside. Little girls love her because she tells them, Hey, little missy, I can hear your heart. They think she's a music box. When Suzanne was ten years old, her mother said, Let's have a tea party. They sat together at the kitchen table. It was the first time Suzanne ever drank tea. She put four teaspoons of sugar in it. She said, it's too cold. Her mother said, I'll only tell you this once, so mark my words. I broke the rocking horse, Suzanne said. You, of all my children, were made like an angel. But you want to look over the edge to hell. Always know where that line is, and never cross it. And here are nine kisses, her mother continued, for every year of your life. While she kissed her again and again on the forehead, Suzanne wished her mother wore lipstick so that the kisses would be painted on her and everyone would know. She wanted to say, but I'm ten, really. What can you tell us about this book? Why... Did it remain a bit dormant before becoming a bestseller years later? Well, it's interesting how every book in a 
in an odd way, has its own life. So I moved to New York City in 1978 to go to New York University. And immediately I was part of the art scene in New York. I was very good friends with Keith Haring. And in fact, the first poetry readings um, I did were part of his uh, Wednesday night poetry uh, events that he used to have at Club 57. And then Suzanne moved to New York in, in 1980. And we actually met, we were both working as waitresses at a Mexican restaurant. And she was uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's girlfriend. So just as she was amused to him, he, he, he uh, painted many paintings where she's uh, present. She was also amused to me. I wrote many poems about her at that time. And she was also amused to Francesco Clemente, although those paintings uh, were lost in a fire. And so uh, after Jean-Michel died of an overdose from heroin, uh, I thought about writing a book about Suzanne. I mean, I really feel that it's, even though it's a book a lot about Basquiat, it's really, I see it as a kind of love letter to her, to our friendship, and we're still great friends. And so I wrote Widow Basquiat, and at first nobody wanted to publish it, and finally, Canongate in the UK published it and it had incredible reviews. I tend to be quite experimental in my writing and so in general people reject what is new and so uh, it took a while to sort of understand the book I think. But then when Canongate brought it over to the uh, United States uh, the book came out on a Sunday and then on Tuesday was 9-11. So that meant that, you know, nobody read the book. We were all in a global tragedy and nothing happened. I should say that the, the book is um, is experimental in the sense that I wanted it not to be about the time, but I wanted it to be of the time. And it took a while for, for that to be understood. And in fact, the art critic, the most important art critic on that time, uh, said exactly that, that Widow Basquiat is representation. So it, it's a book of the time. And then uh, after Prayers for the Stolen came out, it was uh, relaunched again. And then it has become uh, uh, quite, quite, a, quite a success and considered to be sort of one of the most important books of that time. Love me the way Jennifer, the act of writing and someone reading at the other end is, for me, in a way, a mystical experience because there is this intuitive understanding and realization of the meaning of the words and how they relate to the writer's and the reader's own existence. And both are united by a sort of invisible thread. In his book, Essay of Three Decades, Thomas Mann wrote, A writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. How do you choose the right words while writing? And how do you start the music, so to say? And do you get the feeling someone is hearing you at the other end? So I would say that probably, um, yes, I agree uh, that it is a mystical relationship for example as a writer it's always it never ceases to be magical that somebody would like my book i never get used to that it's always sort of miraculous to me i would say the poetry that i write uh is tends to be uh more in a kind of um realm of uh 
a kind of more maybe sort of spiritual exercise, if we want to put it that way, you know, of of uh, trying to find a kind of language that one can trust. That's why I say spiritual, because uh, I often think that, well, what Coleridge said, poetry is at its best when it's not completely understood. And so it's that mystery that you have to trust. And I think that's important in poetry. In the novels, I think something else happens. I mean, many of my novels are about very difficult subjects. So Prayers for the Stolen is about the stealing of little girls in Mexico. Gun Love is about the trafficking of guns. Well, the violent, gun violence in the United States and then the trafficking of guns to, uh, to Mexico and Central America. I think it's an important thing to, to tell the audience in case they don't know that a lot of this tremendous um, migration to the United States, illegal migration from Mexico and Central America, is that they are people fleeing terrible violence that is sustained by U.S. guns. And uh, in fact, the University of San Diego did a whole study on this. And if the guns were not crossing the border and going south, 47% of all gun dealers would be out of business in the United States. So it's practically 50% of the business is what leaves the country. So for me, the challenge as a writer was, how do I write about these things with enchantment, with poetry, and with beauty? And it and and it's actually what I'm trying to do. I I want to make it bearable for me. I want to make it to make it bearable for my characters in my book, and I want to make it bearable also for the reader. And so the challenge is exactly that. In my case, to to try and find a language that that um, brings a kind of beauty to what is uh, tragic. This beauty in the language is so authentic, right? Because like Robert Frost said once, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. So you can't really fake it. I would agree with that. I'm always, I have tears and I have surprise. Uh, that's why, you know, when people are always saying, you know, how do you write a book? I mean, there's, it's something so mysterious and, and often you don't even know where the book is going. But I know that one thing that does happen to me is that uh, I I am always very aware of treating my characters with dignity. So, for example, in Prayers for the Stolen, uh, when uh, obviously one of the characters has been used by many men uh, in a kind of a terrible kidnapping of her, uh, you know, I would never describe that scene ever. So what I have her say is, you know, what can I tell you? I was like a plastic water bottle that everybody took a drink from. You know, I'm always looking for the metaphor that takes me away from the cliché and the sort of horrible writing of describing a scene like that. Where you're, you're a poet. That's where you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Václav Havel, former president of the Czech Republic, a playwright and essayist, also a poet, wrote a beautiful letter while being in prison to his first wife and also dissident Olga Havlova. In this letter, he describes being in a hot, cloudy summer day. And so he's sitting watching a beautiful landscape of which he's separated through wires and bars. And he's looking up to the sky. And then he had a sort of revelation. And he wrote, I was flooded with a sense of ultimate happiness and harmony with the world and with myself, with that moment, with all the moments I could call up, and with everything invisible that lies behind it and has meaning. I would even say that I was somehow struck by love, though I don't know precisely for whom or what. Have you experienced this joy? And have you had been able to express it in writing? 
I think I, I think I have experienced that joy, and I think I have experienced it in writing. I mean, I think that one of the most sort of ecstatic, I mean, I would call that experience of his a kind of um, moment of ecstasy, and there are examples in literature of ecstasy writing. I would say the Song of Songs in the Bible is is a form of ecstatic writing. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, immediately what comes to mind in my own books is the scene where Selena Quintanilla, who was the famous Tejana Mexico singer, who was killed, uh, obviously with a gun. This is in in Gun Love, the book Gun Love, by her manager. Her manager is able to just go buy a gun at the shop on the corner and kills her. And and so she runs through the parking lot bleeding and ends up in the lobby of the hotel where she dies on the on the floor of the of the hotel lobby. And in that scene, all of a sudden she came to me as a bird, as a bird that was flying and, and bleeding out as she flew. And instead of her running away from death, she was running toward death. And she was saying, wait for me, wait for me, I'm coming, I'm coming. So she, she was embraced by death. And that was sort of an ecstatic moment of writing. I didn't know that it would be like that. There is a poem of yours, actually, a very brief poem, which is a wonderful example of how your writing enables the reader to experience an idea through all of his or her senses. And the most incredible part of it is how it opens the door for the reader to a whole new dimension, a dimension where he or she can also dream both asleep and awake. So in, in, in this uh, in between this duerme vela. I would like to share this poem with our audience. This is Lemon Tree by Jennifer Clement. If you climb a lemon tree, fell its bark with your feet and knees, smell its white flowers, rub in your hands its leaves, remember the tree is older than you and in its branches you might find stories. Jennifer, we were talking uh, just now about breaking barriers through writing and also your rich and multicultural, pluralistic um, U.S. American, British, Mexican, Latin American upbringing, and which I guess enable you to grow up hand in hand with Shakespeare, Virginia Woolf, Cervantes, Juan Rulfo, Borges, thanks to, to your father and to this education um, you got in the British system and provided you, I think so, with a perspective where frontiers are no more and imagination allows you to just run free to places where ink is there only to draw bridges of communication. And this had surely some influence on a document which was introduced by Penn International under your presidency. I am referring to the Democracy of the Imagination Manifesto. And before we hear an excerpt of this manifesto, I want to ask you, what would your definition of imagination be, first of all? And secondly, why would imagination be so important that it is ought to be recognized and protected as a human right? So for me as president of Penn International, it was very important because we are the oldest and largest writers' organization in the world. It was founded in 1921, and we have centers in over 100 countries. And uh, it to me, it was important that it not be sort of uh, like an old-fashioned organization, that it really address the time and be very relevant today. And so one of the things that I did was the Imagination Manifesto, because I think that what we're seeing happening right now, and it makes me very worried for young writers, is that there is this, there's two things that are happening. One is that uh, you are expected to write from your own experience and from your own group. And this means that immediately your imagination 
is, is unable to work. When I teach, I always give this example of the most beautiful scene that I've ever read of a woman giving birth was written by James Baldwin. So it was written by a man. And so I'm very concerned that writers will feel that they're afraid of being attacked if they come out of their group or come out of their experience. So I felt that Penn needed to have a document that would protect those writers so those writers could say, Penn defends my imagination. The other thing that is not exactly in the Imagination Manifesto, so, oh, back, excuse me, back to the other part of your question about the imagination. The thing about the imagination that's so important, it's that we're all, it's where all discovery happens. So, you know, you're not going to go to the moon unless you imagine that you can go to the moon. I mean, without imagination, there's no discovery. It's a very important part of what it means to be human. And, uh, the other th thing that I think it's also important is that what's happened in today's time is that there is no space for making mistakes. And if you're going to be a rebel, and if you're going to be an artist, or if you're just going to maybe fall in love with somebody that it doesn't work out, I mean, your whole, this whole sort of impossibility of making a mistake because everybody's so afraid of being canceled and attacked. And I always love the uh, example of ceramics in Japan, the kintsugi, where what is broken and what is cracked is what has most value, because it's what has had experience. And so I think, you know, part of what I did in Penn was to address this and create a, a document where writers could use it to defend themselves. So to say that imagination would be the mother of all human rights at the end because it's where all the consciousness starts it's like crossing the door between what i imagine the idea and then bringing it to reality for others to experience it we're gonna hear the excerpt of the democracy of the imagination manifesto now the opening of the pen international charter states that literature knows no frontiers This speaks to both real and, no less importantly, those imagined. Penn stands against notions of national and cultural purity that seeks to stop people from listening, reading, and learning from each other. One of the most treacherous forms of censorship is self-censorship, where walls are built around the imagination and often raised from fear of attack. Penn believes the imagination allows writers and readers to transcend their own place in the world, to include the ideas of others. This place for some writers has been prison, where the imagination has meant interior freedom and often survival. The imagination is the territory of all discovery, as ideas come into being as one creates them. It is often the confluence of contradiction, found in metaphor and simile, where the most profound human experiences reside. For almost 100 years, Penn has stood for freedom of expression. Penn also stands for, and believes in, the freedom of the empathetic imagination, while recognizing that many have not been the ones to tell their own stories. When reading this text for the first time, it reminded me of a beautiful essay made book by Irene Vallejo, El Infinito en un Junco, in English, Papyrus, the Invention of Books in the Ancient World. In the last uh, Frankfurter Book Fair, she gave an extraordinary inaugural speech based in that book, which recognizes the huge undertaking of translators to enable books to cross territories. And this was beautifully translated by um, Charlotte Whittle to English. And so she began with a wonderful quote, There is an atlas where all territories are my homeland. I have roamed across them with my eyes, which move like travelers through snowy paper meadows on the trail of those dark footprints, letters. Then she talked about the wonderful exchange of cultures that happened in the city of Toledo in Castilla, how classical and Byzantine wisdom were enriched by Indian scientific 
literary knowledge reinterpreted later by Islamic culture and brought to the Iberian Peninsula by the Umayyad dynasty, and how the translation of these books would later reach the universities and monasteries of that time, like Montpellier and Paris and Pisa, Oxford and Heidelberg and so on. So reading about how literature is by nature an interlaced history of culture, language, and philosophy, I can just not understand, and maybe maybe you can help me on this, Jennifer, how can cultural appropriation, and you were talking a little bit about this before, be possible in literature? Well, I think there's maybe better ways to say that, but certainly in literature, uh, there is always going to be tradition. And so, for example, I'll give you uh, one example that's very clear to me. So you have Gabriel Garcia Marquez's uh, Labyrinth of Solitude. Well, what is the DNA of that book? The DNA of that book is Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. You can't have Labyrinth of Solitude without having Pedro Paramo. And then what is the DNA of Pedro Paramo? Well, the DNA of Pedro Paramo is Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. In fact, Paramo means more, as a matter of fact. And uh, there are many uh, things that you can find uh, between these two books. So I'm giving an example of three books that, that are born from one another and are all about the world of the dead. And they all are about dead people. So, you know, for me, it's just something quite natural and not something uh, aggressive. Following with this incredible speech of Irene Vallejo, and she said that Frankfurt, referring to the book fair, was precisely a capital and crossroads of translations. And then, now I quote her exact words, She said, literature and ideas come here in search of a second skin of boundless rebirths. When we translate, we set out from difference to reclaim closeness. We affirm that to be faithful, we must use our imagination. So we were talking about imagination before and about this concept of cultural appropriation. And in this respect, what can you say, and you were already talking about this a little bit before, about the young writers. What can you say about the dangers of self-censorship? Well, it's one of the worst kinds of censorship um, because it's insidious, because you, you're not even aware that you're doing it. Often it's happening sort of unconsciously. So you're putting brakes on yourself constantly. And Uh, that's very worrisome. If, if I mean, you know, I think a, a lot of art um, is an act of rebellion, and especially poetry, because since poetry has no commercial value, just the act of doing it is an act of rebellion. And so, you you need to be in a space of freedom, and that's why freedom of expression is also part of this equation. Well, I could go away. A writer and a single mom that lived in poverty many years and who is now an activist herself and who has donated millions of dollars to protect the rights of women and therefore for her, sex is a reality that cannot be erased. And by the way, she has never been hateful by any means. A couple of months ago, she wrote in Twitter, if sex isn't real, There's no same-sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. 
So this is J.K. Rowling, who was set on fire for her comments on transgender. Also in this relation, how do we protect freedom of speech without letting hateful rhetoric be spread? Well, that's many questions. You know, first I would say that um, believing in free expression, you know, J.K. Rowling has a right to her free expression, as does the trans community have a right to their free expression. Uh, and we need to have tolerance and acceptance and listening to one another. In terms of hate speech, um, this is definitely a problem, and it's a problem we've addressed at Penn. We have a whole document about this. It's it's hard because uh, all these new platforms allow hate to to move around the world very fast and uh, and and create a lot of damage, including. Uh, often backed by lies and things like this. I mean, in Penn, if you're a member of Penn within our charter, you know, you're you are not allowed to spread lies or 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 do uh, you know, write any kind of propaganda and things like this or or have any kind of hate speech. So already if you're a member of Penn, there's a sense that what you speak and what you say, you have responsibility there is responsibility for what you say. So it, it's a complex problem, and but I think that I still, for me, it would be very, um, we have to take great care to try and put any kind of uh, barriers to free speech, because then you're in the problem of who is policing what is said. And we know from history that that can be extremely dangerous. So I would say I'm quite of the of the group that really believes in freedom of expression uh, because of the fear of who would be policing it, it otherwise. Hi, we would love to hear your comments and learn about what you see. Share your input at www.ccpodcast.com and follow us on social media. Oh, I almost forgot. To accompany us in this season's journey, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And now let's continue with CC. Let's talk about technology and literature. A ferocious lobbying by dominating corporations of the virtual world is in big part presently deciding what shall be listened and read. And that, by the way, goes hand in hand with the shrugging of attention span and of the songs we hear and the visuals we see and the articles that we read, which in fact are getting shorter and shorter as we speak. Another big problem is the easiness with which one can copy the protected work of authors without any notice or censorship. And there is another manifesto by Penn International, the Copyright Manifesto, which is a knockout in the advocacy for these rights. During also your presidency, Jennifer, of Penn International, you presented this manifesto, and you also said that copyright is central to freedom of expression and that it relates directly to democracy. Could you explain this relationship and why shall copyright interest us all? Well, I mean, it's the protection of uh, the writer's work. And so uh, it was with, with all these platforms and new technologies, as you said, it's very easy to steal things and take things. And we felt it was important that as I said, the oldest and, and largest writers association make a stand for copyright so that if any uh, lawyers or judges needed to have the voice of writers in any judgments they were making, they would see that writers feel strongly about copyright. It seems important to have made that document with everything that is going on in technologies today. And it's and it's also wonderful to think that one of the reasons, you know, copyright came into being, it came into being, you know, through the works of Dickens with Victor Hugo, 
a realization that, you know, all their works were being just sold all over the world and copied and often copied and changed and and censored. I mean, we know that, for example, China, you could, they can publish your book and take out chunks of, of your work. So it's also a protection of censorship. And of the message, right? Being uh, conveyed as it is. Exactly. And continuing with technology and its use in the artistic creation process, artists around the world debate about Sunny Award-winning image by German photographer Boris Eldaxen in the Creative Open category. Eldaxen used artificial intelligence to produce the winning photograph. And he refused to accept the award and said that he did this in the hope to speed up the debate about the use of artificial intelligence in art. What are your, your thoughts about the use of artificial intelligence in literature? Well, to be honest, I feel like what he said is actually very interesting to me because this wanting to speed up the debate. You know, I don't feel that I, at this moment, exactly understand the complexity of the ramifications. And I'm not talking about technology, I'm talking about ethics. And I think we need to really look at this carefully And I don't feel that um, that we know enough yet to make a judgment. We do feel a threat, for sure. Uh, and the other side of this fear could be that what is human becomes more valuable. I mean, that could also be a consequence of all of this. Like, at the end, we end up with art uh, being made by machines and art being made by 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 humans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As president of Penn International, you also created the Penn International Women's Manifesto, which proclaims that For women to have a free speech, the right to read, the right to write, they need to have the right to roam physically, socially, and intellectually. What did you mean with this? Well, it was very important to uh, being, I couldn't ignore the fact that I was the first woman president of Penn International, and therefore I felt it was important to address uh, the place of women writers in the world. And there, obviously there are many things that we know already, but it's it's actually a lot worse than we thought because even in the English language where uh, is the greatest privilege and the most prizes and the most possibilities for publication, even there we found out, for example, that 98% of women who win prizes, their books are the protagonist is a man. We also discovered that very rarely is woman's writing Uh, uh, compared to men's writing, and almost never would a man's writing be compared to a woman's writing. So these these biases are sometimes very obvious and sometimes very subtle. So the thing about being able to it's it's it has to do with freedom. So that manifesto begins with the frontiers, the idea that literature knows frontiers, and says that for women and for almost for women almost. Um, at one time everywhere and now in most most everywhere the frontier for a woman was her the doorway of her parents house or her husband's house that was her frontier so she was you know we see it in afghanistan now you know girls are not allowed to go to school the girls that wanted to go to school in iraq that were poisoned these are the extreme places where women have no freedom to learn and The other thing that I that was important to me about that part of the manifesto also is that the next line is there are few societies um, that don't see with hostility a woman who walks by herself. So the woman who walks by herself is almost always the prostitute. But for example, the night belongs to men. And in terms of literature, I mean, of writings that I have loved, have been, for example, Borges's nighttime walks through Buenos Aires that are beautiful, beautiful uh, poems. And Octavio Paz also wrote about his nighttime walks from San Ildefonso to the main square, the Zócalo in Mexico. And I realized, you know, 
there isn't really any literature of women being able to have nighttime walks because we can't move in the night. And so that's a, what you read is the part of the manifesto that addresses that in particular. Interior freedom and exterior freedom. You're so right. Absolutely. You know, in a wonderful set of six episodes, I guess, yeah, I remember well, yeah, aired in the 80s of a series called The Power of Myth. I don't know if you saw it, produced by PBS. Um, Joseph Campbell. Exactly. Yes. Uh, for, yes. Can, exactly. So um, Joseph Campbell, for our audience, is a professor for compared mythology and religion. And he was interviewed by Bill Moyers. And he explained how through history, in order to control the world, patriarchal authority drove the goddess away from the pantheon of imagination and changing the metaphors and with this leaving the figure of the goddess only as a symbol of fertility but never as an equal. So what happens when the ability of a woman to use her imagination or her intelligence is crushed? What does the world loses when the worldview of a woman is lost? Well, I think that we we move we lose half of humanity. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, just imagine what is lost to humanity because of this. And in fact, that imagination manifesto ends on this. And I wanted to express the terrible loss to humanity of women's intelligence and imagination. Um, imagine what we would have in the world if that had been allowed to blossom. So I'll just quote the end of the manifesto, which says, humanity is both wanting and bereft without the full and free expression of women's creativity and knowledge. So that's how dra dramatic I live it. It's a terrible loss. It's a terrible loss. And for, for the good part, your the pages of your books are filled with women voices. <laughs> and you write about their strength and how women, how we're capable of enormous resilience and friendship and compassion. And now I would like um, to play an excerpt of your fantastic novel turned movie, Prayers for the Stolen. Every time Concha would tell us what had happened to Paula, the story was different. So we never knew the truth. The drug trafficker who went to the house before Paula was stolen only went to get a good look at her. He went to see if the rumors were true. They were true. It was different when Paula was stolen. On our mountain, there were no men. It was like living where there were no trees. It is like being a person with one arm, my mother said. No, no, no. She corrected herself. Being in a place without men is like being asleep without dreams. Our men crossed the river to the United States. They dipped their feet in the water and waded up to their waists, but they were dead when they got to the other side. In that river, they shed their women and their children and walked into the great big USA cemetery. She was right. They sent money. They came back once or twice, and then that was that. So on our land, we were clumps of women working and trying to raise ourselves up. The only men around inhabited SUVs, rode motorcycles, and appeared from out of nowhere with an AK-47 hanging from their shoulder, a bag of cocaine in the back pocket of their jeans, and a pack of Marlboro Reds in their front shirt pocket. They wore Ray-Ban sunglasses, and we had to make sure we never looked into their eyes, never saw the small black pupils that lay there, and was the path inside their minds. Um, you were telling us about this extraordinary novel at the beginning of our interview, being about little girls. Tell us mo more about it, please. And, and also, how were you able to depict such a tremendously painful and horrific story so beautifully? Well, first, I'm really glad you picked that excerpt of that book because I think, you know, it's important for me at least, to, to say that, you know, that this book is not a, a book of hate towards men. It's about what happens when you lose the protection of men. And so that's why it's so important to me that Rita says, 
living without men is like sleeping without dreams or only having one arm. It, it's about the loss of that protection, which is so devastating to women. So, well, basically what happened is I was very interested in understanding what was happening to women in Mexico with the violence of the terrible drug cartels. And the the stories in Mexico were very male-driven. So we have a genre of literature now called narco literature, and it was very driven. It was all sort of men's stories. And even in the news, the news that was covered was the news of you know how many men had died, what the men were doing. And there was just very little about uh, what was happening with women. So for about two years, I was interviewing the women of drug traffickers, mostly women in hiding. And then I heard about this situation that was happening in the state of Guerrero. A woman in Mexico City told me that their little girls were being stolen and that they were having to dig holes in their fields or in their front patios so that when they saw these SUVs coming, uh, they would uh, hide the girls in these holes and cover the holes then with some leaves or some cardboard. And so immediately I was so deeply affected by this image. On one hand, it was as though, you know, they were, uh, it was sort of like a warren of rabbits with their little hearts beating under the ground. At the same time, it was like being buried alive. And that's when I knew that my book was going to be about the most vulnerable girls in Mexico, which are these little girls that are in danger of being stolen. This is horrific, as I've said before. And um, now I would like to play another clip of an excerpt of another novel of yours, which is Gone Love. You referred to it already. Um, it was wonderfully reviewed by the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Guardian, the Economist, and so on. Many others will establish critics. And this novel uncovers America's fascination with firearms and provides the reader with a glimpse into the deathly world of gun culture. Gun Love My mother was a cup of sugar. You could borrow her any time. My mother was so sweet, her hands were always birthday party sticky. Her breath held the five flavors of Lifesavers candy and she knew all the love songs that are a university for love. She knew, slowly walk close to me, where did you sleep last night, born under a bad sign, and all the I'll kill you if you leave me songs. But sweetness is always looking for Mr. Bad, and Mr. Bad can pick out Miss Sweet in any crowd. My mother opened her mouth in a great wide O and breathed him right into her body, I couldn't understand. She knew all the songs. So why would she get messed and stirred up with this man? When he said his name was Eli, she was down on her knees. His voice tamed her immediately. The first words he said were all she needed. He spoke, singing. I am your medicine, sweet baby. My, oh me, oh my. Your name has always been written on my heart. And from there on, all he had to do was whistle for her. As in Prayers for the Stolen, this novel also depicts a social issue, but this time in the U.S. And I had the feeling that it was that this gun love novel was sort of a mirror or a diptych, if you wish, to Prayers for the Stolen. Is is that correct? Yeah, no, it's completely correct. In fact, um, Pearl who's the main character in Gun Love, actually makes an appearance in Prayers for the Stolen. There's a lot of stitching between them. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's absolutely true. And yes, it's about um, this horrible, incomprehensible love for guns in the United States, and, and it's how it devastates a community, and but also in that community in the United States, are Mexicans. And um, so Prayers for the Stolen is a little bit how, I mean, it, all, these novels have many different subjects going on at the same time. But, you know, you could say that that um, that Prayers for the Stolen is how perhaps 
a Mexican girl gets to the United States. And Gun Love is also about perhaps about how uh, a, an American girl might get to Mexico. So this Pearl character, people told me about her in this state of Guerrero in Mexico. They said there was an American girl up on the mountain uh, who was very, very white, like they didn't say she was blonde. They said she was white, and they always emphasized that she was extremely white. So I, that's why Pearl in Gun Love is very, very white, because she's based on, she's almost like an albino in a way, transparent in a way, because they were always emphasizing this about this American girl who was very young and that who lived in up there where the poppies were grown to make heroin in Mexico. Jennifer, this novel can easily be turned into a movie, too, I, I think. I hope so. <laughs> And um, as in Prayers for the Stolen in Gun Love, as we said, you managed to write poetically about guns without ceasing to emphasize your 100% rejection and criticism against them. Andrew Silly, who is president of the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., As someone that extensively knows and has, as I've said, deep knowledge about both of these issues and in general their realities confronted in the U.S.-Mexican border, and whose book, by the way, I recommend in case anyone wants to understand what the current situation that part of the world is. The name of the book is Vanishing Frontiers, the Forces Driving Mexico and the United States Together. So Andrew Silly was a previous guest, and he referred to your work and what your work reminds us in terms of migration. Let's let's hear. Jennifer Clement is one of my favorite poets and authors. She's first, I think, and first and foremost, a poet. And though she's written a number of novels, but her novels are just infused with poetry. Her writing is poetic. But she's reminding us of those large number of people out there for whom movement is, and as you said earlier, I mean, you know, movement is always hard. Crossing international boundaries is always, you always leave something, often family, but customs and a way of life and to start something else. It's hard for everyone, but it's particularly hard for those who don't have access to moving legally, who may not have documents where they've moved, who may not be able to come home for years because they can't come back again, they do. I mean, you know, we need to figure out a way that legal mobility around the world does not become something that is only for the already well-off. When Dr. Sully says that you're essentially a poet whose prose is full of poetry, he's not alone. Francisco Goldman of the New York Times Book Review also wrote a wonderful critic about prayers for the stolen. And among other things, he said that Clement writes a poet's prose, spare and simple, creating her own world through patterns of repeated and varied metaphors and images that blossom inside the reader like radiant puppies. Prayers for the Stolen gives us words for what we haven't had words for before, like something translated from a dream in a secret language. This passionate liaison between prose and poetry Is it a gender of its own? Well, first I want to just say that's so lovely of Dr. Seeley to mention my work. I'm also a great uh, admirer of everything that he does, and he's such an important voice at this time for what is happening and which, and which seems to be getting worse and worse by the day. So that's, that's very, very kind and special for me. Uh, and so, I mean... There are writers who write uh, poetic prose. I mean, I don't think I'm the only person who does that. It's 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 not that uncommon. But uh, it's it you know it's it's hard to really uh, explain exactly what it is. But I, going back to what I said earlier, it's this idea of how can I talk about very difficult subjects with a language that makes it bearable. And so, for example, in Gun Love, it was a huge challenge for me to try and figure out how am I going to write about this in a new way, in a fresh way, and in a way that makes it bearable. So I already told you about the scene with Selena Quintanilla, where she becomes this bird that's bleeding out, and she's running toward death. And And then in that book, there's also a moment, because I'm interested in different states of consciousness, 
what you were talking about, Duerme Vela and things like that. Um, so when the main character has daydreams where she's sort of asleep and sort of awake, this allows magical things to happen. So in the book, for example, there are, are times, and especially one specific time, where what I call there's a gun song where the, so the guns speak and the guns sing and the guns tell the story of their crimes. So through language, I'm able to, to create uh, a different way of looking at it. Love me the way That you would There's no better way Like overlapping fields of, of, of human life, right? Yes. Jennifer, we will hear now, because I warned the audience that has not have um, the chance to know you by your writings, to have the chance to hear this, and we will hear this, an, an elegant and exquisitely erotic poem of yours titled Making Love in Spanish. Making Love in Spanish When I make love to you in English, the objects in the room have no gender, and I only hear our voices. But when I make love to you in Spanish, the chairs, those little girls, chatter and our shoes want to step, step with adoration, on the body of light, lamplight, that falls across the floor. In Spanish, the tangled sleeves of our sweaters sigh with soft, womanly voices, and fall like long vines around an armchair that has become their master. The roses bathe and bow, filled with desire for the clock, and fragile windows want to break into the mirror. Here, your pockets worship my stockings. Here, the white walls worship a white moon. In the dark, I give you my feminine mouth. In the dark, I give you my masculine eyes. Jennifer, through your poetry, you give us readers flesh and bones. When did you first fall in love with poetry? Well, I've just written a memoir of um, sort of my childhood and youth, trying to answer this question. And it, because it's a, even though it's a book about my life, it's really a book, an intellectual uh, exercise into how did this love of language and sort of, uh, you know, Octavio Paz said, you know, language is his country, and I, I feel the same way. Language is my country. And Jennifer, the name of this book is The Promised Party, Carlo Basquiat and Me, right? Exactly. So at a very, very young age. So for some reason, I was writing poetry at age seven and at age eight, and I still have those poems because my father would have them typed up. And so they're there, and the date is there, and I was definitely writing them. <laughs> So I've, as long as I'm sort of aware, um, I've always been writing poems. It's just me, and it's just always been a part of me and a love of reading. I've always loved to read. Uh, I was that kind of a child that was just always with her, her head inside of a book. And uh, it's mysterious, but yes, I always had obviously some sort of need to to express what I was seeing. There's no better way to keep away tears. Oh, yeah. when in, in a world of poetry, I it is difficult to imagine the absence of words. Although silence does has a message sometimes that it's even more powerful than words. But nevertheless, silence always pertains to a certain instant. And it's only through written words that this message can be 
convey to more people and reach a bigger audience. The voice of activists allowed those that had been silenced by exile, imprisonment, or death to be heard. And it is a risky business, a very brave one. You recently received the Freedom of Expression Award in Brussels by the Brussels University Alliance, VUB and ULB. And you're very open about talking about how both of your parents, your mom and dad, were politically active in the civil rights movement in the U.S., And I guess this influenced your strong sense of duty. But besides your upbringing, what would you say has moved you so powerfully to become such a strong activist in defense of freedom of, of speech? Yes, I was raised in a house where giving back was important. Uh, and I was also raised in a country of terrible poverty, terrible violence, terrible inequality, And I was very aware of that, even as a little girl. You know, I had shoes on my feet, and I would leave my house, and I would find most of the world out there didn't have shoes on their feet. Um, in the 1970 census of Mexico, one of the questions is, do you have shoes? So I was very aware of suffering in a very deep way. Now we're going to hear an excerpt of what the introduction of the Democracy of Imagination Manifesto is regarding how PEN International was founded and what does it is exactly. PEN International was founded in London in 1921 to promote friendship and intellectual cooperation among writers everywhere, emphasize the role of literature in developing understanding, stand for freedom of expression, and act as a powerful voice on behalf of writers harassed, silenced, imprisoned, and sometimes killed for their views. How strong must this vocation be? Because members of Penn International engage in these tasks pro bono, with no payment at all. And I ask myself, how strong must this vocation be, knowing the risks they incur in when speaking out? Well, it's exactly that. It's vocational work. So it means that you have to have um, a great belief in freedom of expression and be willing to fight for it. And uh, it's every day it's very humbling because every day I'm in contact with people who risk everything to tell the truth. And the thing is this, if we don't know the truth, how can we act? How do we know what we need to do? For example, right now in Penn, we're very aware that journalists covering the environment are being killed all over the world. And we know this is going to get worse as laws to protect the environment get stronger. So, you know, if you don't know that a river is being polluted, how can you save that river? So the protection of the freedom of expression is also the protection of the truth. I have a final question. <laughs> we reached the, fin the, the final part. Yeah. We have been talking about your voice as a poet, a writer, and an advocate now for freedom of expression and about giving others a voice. But now I, I would like to know, how do you as a teacher or mentor recognize someone's unique voice and help him or her recognize his or her voice and express it to the world? Well, obviously, when I do teach, when I teach creative writing, I'm not ever interested in anybody sounding like me. I want them to sound like themselves. And you cannot, you can almost not really teach that in a way. I mean, it's something mysterious that maybe you have found what you, what you're, what you sound like and maybe you haven't but it is something almost impossible to teach. Why do you say it's almost impossible? Have you had any um, experience? Well, because I don't want to say impossible, but I mean, there there's something that we could call um, your voice, or you could call it the gift, or you could call it talent. I mean, there's something there that's that's mysterious. It's a personal call. 
or a personal uh, gift of some mysterious kind. Or it could be the muse, is what people used to think it was, that you were visited actually by a muse, and she inspired you and, and made it happen. We don't think about the muse anymore, but maybe it's a muse. You're right. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jennifer, for a wonderful time full of poetry and such an insightful and brilliant interview. Thank you, Ceci, for inviting me. Thank you to our listeners wherever you are for having allowed us to share time with you. Please do not forget to check this episode's description to inform yourself about Jennifer Clement's work, including her last novel, The Promised Party, Calo, Basquiat and Me. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, let's spend the day with us open wide. There's no